I am going to be talking, I'm going to be talking about a section of a larger paper that's titled Dancing with Difference, Transsexual Sadomasochism as a General Economy. And so this paper aims to explore Derrida's idea of dance and examine its relationship with feminist erotic economies, connecting Badaya's story of the eye to Susan Stryker's concept of dungeon intimacy, to argue that one can theorize transsexual sadomasochism as a general economy through Derridian elements such as deferred presence or difference, trace and play, and critiques of delos and atomism. Susan Stryker outlines the influence of BDSM dungeons in the development of queer concepts, arguing that they are not merely theoretical ideas that are created by a stable subject and disseminated through academic circles, rather they were both created and disseminated within the context of practice and places process. One can introduce the Derridian elements of dance and play to both amend and expand on Stryker's account, theorizing dungeons as playgrounds where one may explore and enact ever-evolving choreographies. So Bataille coins the term accursed share to refer to an excessive and non-recuperable portion of an economy. A crucial aspect of Bataille's account of the accursed share as a general economy is how it relates to the realms of the erotic. A restricted libidinal, libidinal economy deals with feelings of desire but Bataille wants to examine the tension that transgression and taboo incurs within the realms of the erotic. Acts that are both simultaneously erotic and transgressive introduce an element of pain and or disgust that brings in the idea of waste that is referred to by the accursed share within a general economy. Bataille exemplifies this with the concept of the limit experience, that is, Experiences of intensity that are sim simultaneously both painful and pleasurable, such that it takes us to the limit of our understanding of pain and pleasure. The boundaries between the two are broken. One goes past their ability to process and categor categorize such affects distinctly. And instead of perceiving either pain or pleasure, one just per perceives intensity. These limit experiences hence expose the limitations in our conceptual toolkit when thinking of libidinal economies as restricted circulation of desire and pleasure. The restricted libidinal economy fails to capture experiences that deal in the excess, experiences that are not a function of satisfying a lack, but rather function as limit experiences of pure excess. Roland Barth, for instance, outlines the deft usage of double binding chains of metaphors in Bataille's text, Story of the Eye, in order to curtail the significatory nature of metaphors. While metaphors usually operate as carriers of meaning by linking a signifier to a fixed referent, Bataille's prose complicates this function by construct constructing two chains of metaphors that serve to refer merely to each other thereby removing the stable bottom that is usually present within metaphors. Barth notes the shapes shifting nature of liquids throughout the text, which all complement the original metaphor of the eye. Um, that is, objects that would usually appear to be unconnected to the eye find themselves caught up in this chain of metaphor, such as bowels of the gourd horse, quote, spilling like a cataract, or quote, the ur urinary liquefaction of the sun. The reason Barth argues that these two interweaving chains of metaphor complicates the very functioning of metaphor is because, quote, it is quite clear that each term is never referring to anything other than the significant of the next term. Barth notes the crucial question in evaluating the function of metaphor is whether all the significance in the stepladder refer to a stable thing that is signified. In short, is there a bottom to the metaphor and consequently a hierarchy to its terms? In making the text a perfectly spherical metaphor, but I therefore complicates the significatory function of metaphor by removing this bottom. With the signifiers no longer serving to signify a stable and concrete referent, but rather serving to signify other signifiers, which in turn loop back to signify the original metaphors. In this way, there is no stable object that is being represented, but rather both the chains signify each other in a spherical fashion. But I becomes particularly intricate where, when he interchanges these chains together such that they share a relationship of contiguity 
where a term from the first is affixed with a term from the second, thereby tampering with the correspondence between these two chains. The interweaving of these two finite series thus creates a unique metaphoric effect that Barth terms a general contagion of qualities and actions. While the eye, the sun, the egg are all tied to the genital by virtue of metaphorical dependence, through metonymic freedom, they ceaselessly trade meanings and functions, such as breaking eggs in a bathtub, cutting up or putting out an eye, associating a saucer of milk with a dripping vagina or a beam of light with a jet of urine, biting the bull's testicle as if it were an egg. All these associations are at the same time identical and other. But I's usage of metaphor hence matches the transgression of values that is the avowed principle of eroticism with an infraction on the forms of language. Barth's commentary helps exhibit Derridian elements in the text that unfurl a general economy of the erotic, such as deferred presence or difference, trace and play, and critiques of telos and atomism. So moving on to the Derrida section, the formal premise of the term difference is an attempt to undercut the Western philosophical canon's logophonocentrism, that is, their privileging of logos and speech over written language and semiotics. The idea of deferred presence relates specifically to Ferdinand de Saussure's theory of semiotics, that is, the problematic of the sign, as Derrida terms it. Whether one looks at the signified or the signifier, language does not contain ideas nor sounds that lie before or beyond the linguistic system, but rather, quote, only conceptual and phonic differences that have been generated from the system itself. Therefore, the intrinsic content of the sign itself is of less importance than its relation to the other signs around it within its network. However, while Derrida stresses Saussure's influence and importance in developing this differential character of the sign, he maintains that Saussure misses the corollary of deferred presence that follows from this account. Derrida therefore aims to expand on this theory of semiotics using his idea of difference to emphasize that the sign represents the present in its absence. That is, when the presence cannot be present, presented, we signify going through the detour of the sign. In this in the sense is deferred presence. While Saussurean semiotics wants to emphasize the content of the sign as representing the signified in itself, Derrida wants to break away from this order of sensibility and intelligibility, thinking that the discussion of difference belongs to a different philosophical order, that is, that of trace and play. Trace is a pivotal concept in this theory of difference, as Derrida insists that difference cannot be made present. He wants to change this notion, notion of presence to one of trace. In this way, the word trace refers to a chain of signifiers that are interlocked between each other, widening the scope of semiotics to capture the totality of signification rather than the metaphysical approach to reduce difference to a binary interplay of a sign and a signifier. Therefore, Trace also attempts to bypass the framework of causality. Where metaphysics would usually theorize a concrete cause for a concrete effect, Derrida attempts to highlight the various interlocking traces of causes and effects that are indistinguishably entangled within each other. Similarly, Derrida introduces the idea of play to get past the idea of an inherent telos within acts. Derrida wants to dismantle this preconception by arguing that it is impossible to apprehend an intention, a cause, and an origin within actions. Instead, concepts and actions are inscribed in a chain or in a system within which it refers to the other, to other concepts by means of the systematic play of differences. These differences do not have discrete causal relations within each other, rather they play with each other without end nor beginning. Derrida attempts to dispel the myth of a present origin, where he argues against the conceit of a conventional metaphysics of presence that argues that there is first an origin to metaphysical objects that is then replicated to generate presence. Derrida instead maintains that even at the very beginning of an origin, there lies difference, and difference is therefore fundamental and generative, not a product of presence. So by bringing together Derrida's ideas in difference and Barth's analysis of the eroticism in Story of the Eye, we can see the elements of deferred presence, unity of event and structure, and critique of telos and atomism in the novella. 
As Bart asserts, the chains of signifier in the text remove the stable signifier that is usually a feature of Sashurian semiotics. Instead, the metaphors defer meaning and complicate the distinctions between absence and presence by entangling each other in chains of traces that constantly play and refer back to each other. In this way, rather than constructing an erotics of atomism where transgression functions through intention and aggregation, but I use his limit experiences to explore the limits of pain and pleasure themselves. The search for limit experiences, therefore, does not inhabit a restricted economy of exchange and valuation, but rather seeks to explore the limits of our valuations themselves in the form of a general economy. So this ongoing conversation concerning signification within general and restricted economies has implications for how we think of erotic sovereignty, particularly in queer contexts. In her article titled Dungeon Intimacies, The Poetics of Transsexual Sadomasochism, Susan Stryker puts forward an analysis of erotic practices in BDSM dungeons and their influence in the development of queer communities. She coins the term dungeon intimacy to refer to the experience of falling into a practical familiarity with one another's bodies, rooted in the shared history of a subculture at a particular place and time. She notes Michel Foucault's encapsulation of dungeons as a nexus for sexual experimentation, referring to them as laboratories of sexual experimentation. Stryker wants to take up this analogy of the dungeon as a laboratory and extend it to argue that it is a space not just ripe for discovery in the scientific sense of uncovering an objective reality, but also, quote, a playground workshop or a place of study that is in fact a generative space. In this way, the dungeon becomes a place as process, that is, a distinctive manifestation of local and global social, economic, and communication relations that entangle themselves together over an extended period of time and then become concretized in the objects that collectively constitute their place by assembling there. Stryker's conception of a place as process lends itself to an analysis of dungeons as a playground. Transsexual sadomasochism channels the activities through which the body concretizes its location and enacts the body as a place that is contingently situated. Stryker illustrates how these concepts of spatial poetics remain crucial in the development of both queer theory and practice through engaging in historiographies of dungeons such as the Golden Bull in San Francisco. As she writes, the carefully curated guest lists would favor those unlikely to fit into other more rule-bound and identity-defined dungeon spaces. It honored those who abided by the customs of old leather and guided its inher inherited wisdom while celebrating free-form experimentation that broke with traditional subcultural knowledge and practice. I first encountered there the word queer, as it since has, become, has come to be used in academic and community discourse. And transgender was a word I first encountered on a flyer advertising a gender play party there early in 1991. For most of us there, gender was something we explored, analyzed, and experimented within the context of our broader engagement with bodily practices and power. People came at questions of gender from many different angles and emotional investments with no one right way to proceed, end quote. In this way, one can see the influence of spatial poetics on the development and perpetuation of queer concepts. And they're not merely theoretical ideas that are created by a subject and disseminated through academic circles. Rather, they're both created and disseminated within the context of practice and places process. To illustrate this spatial poesis, Stryker recalls an incident at the Golden Bull where she was called on in the middle of a sadomasochistic play scene to take someone's place and step into the structure of the scene. Quote, surrendering herself to its established cadences and giving herself over to the enactment, enactment of a shared pattern of motion where the bod body actively receives and transmits the movements of others, end quote. Stryker theorizes her body as a meeting point, a nexus where extraneous lines of force and social practice, quote, thicken into meat and circulate its movement back into the world. In this way, the body occupies a critical space between stimulus and response that is opened up by the complex social pathways converging in the dungeon. 
Once the body finds itself within the space, it then chooses what sorts of patterns it may repeat and enact. Sadomasochism thus becomes a technology for the production of transgendered embodiment, a mechanism for dismembering and disarticulating received patterns of identification, affect, sensation, and appearance, and for reconfiguring, coordinating, and remapping them in bodily space. Stryker's analysis therefore crucially unpacks the ways in which transsexual sadomasochism functions as a form of play that is almost Iridian. However, aspects of her analysis lend themselves to restricted economies of meaning. I will argue that Derrida's conception of dancing can be reintroduced into Stryker's analysis to instead theorize transsexual sadomasochism as a general economy. Anne Emanuel Berger analyzes Derrida's account of dance, arguing that it goes hand in hand with the idea of difference in destabilizing a stationary place. The key for Derrida in dancing is constant movement, not settling down into a stable place or stasis, for that would bring an end to the choreography. A dance that is constantly in motion may enact a form of spatializing difference, where meaning is actively and constantly deferred in time. While one may attempt to formalize the features of a text and the contours of a thought, Derrida insists that one must recognize the structural instabilities of these constructions, and any attempt to affix meaning to a choreography does so by breaking the movement of reading. Rather, <laughs> reading should be an open and infinite process of constant movement, a kind of dance, as he puts it. Stryker, therefore, comes close to theorizing transsexual sadomasochism as a general economy, particularly when she exclaims, I invent new choreographies of space and time as I dance my whip. However, the key word to amend in this declaration is invent. Stryker's choreographies aim to create conceptions of sexuality and gender when the goal for difference must be to destabilize and explore these ideas. One must not invent choreographies, but rather one must explore choreographies, making sure to keep the dance constantly moving, lest we settle into a stable rhythm that breaks the movement of our reading. To go back to Stryker's usage of Foucault's famous characterization of dungeons as laboratories of sexual experimentation, this idea shows the influence of dungeons in the formulation of sexual difference, but one must be careful not to shape sexual difference into static categories. We can use Derrida's ideas of play and dance to amend this. Instead of being laboratories where scientific experimenting takes place, Dungeons instead can be theorized as playgrounds where one may explore and enact ever-evolving choreographies. Instead of the interplay between stimulus and response thickening into meat, as Stryker suggested, they may otherwise diffuse in into a constantly moving dance. This theorization may fully realize transsexual sadomasochism's potential as a general economy by taking the two chains of transsexuality and sadomasochism and entangling them within each other as symbiotic chains of difference that do not signify a stable third party referent, but rather signify each other in the framework of a general economy in the way that Bataille exhibits in his de the text of Story of the Eye, as well as the ideas of decursed share and limit experiences. Within this framework, just as the linguistic subject does not actively create language, but rather finds themselves within language, so too does the transsexual sadomasochistic subject find themselves captured within a dance that is already moving and must continue to move through the choreographies perpetuated through places as processes. As Stryker demonstrates, this sort of entanglement is already taking place in the form of an interplay between stimulus and response and enacting of shared patterns to create concepts. One just needs a Derridian conceptual lens to help capture the dynamism of these choreographies. Thank you.